Welcome to It Takes a Village, Raising Resilient Kids in Today's World. I'm Dr. Ann Bergen. And we are back in the studio after quite a um, hiatus from uh, COVID related, but we're back now. And we're so lucky in our community to have this incredible TV studio or radio station and the incredible people who work to bring all of this together. So it's good to be back. And um, as a lifelong educator, I think maybe if I look at my career over maybe almost 50 years, one of the things um, that I've become more concerned about is the emotional health of our young people. And well before COVID struck, um, I was concerned about the emotional distress that our young people are feeling. And it's showing up in, obviously, in substance use, in um, incidents of cutting, uh, eating disorders, suicidal ideation, and, and perfectionism, this huge pressure to be perfect and to please, and um, it's taking its toll on our young people. But, but the research, the good thing is the research is really coming out and, and talking a lot about how we can support our young people in building a, a strong inner core and building that resilience so that when life throws its inevitable curves that, that kids are ready to deal with it. And we need to be able to give them coping strategies and ways to deal with this. And it's an important part, I, I think, about our mission as educators. And I think given the pain that our young people are experiencing, and it isn't, it isn't just young people, it's sort of infiltrating you know, um, young adulthood, um, and it's, it's impacting so many of us, that it's really important that we talk about it, we have conversations about it, that we, that we share um, our stories. And one of the things that I, I, I have found in, in doing all of this research is that it's really important that we, we listen to young people, that we, we have to hear how they're experiencing life, because we all think because we went through it, we have the answers. But every generation is experiencing life in different ways, and we have to come from where they are and learn, we have to learn from each other. And I am so lucky today because I have two high school um, seniors who are, have graciously given up their uh, part of their vacation time with so much on their plates to come and have a conversation with me um, to talk about sort of, not as experts on anything really, but just sharing your experience and, and your observations. So I'm gonna welcome Gretchen and Emma today. Um, and again, just to have a conversation with you and to start off, I want to, um, again, hear your perspectives. Again, not expecting you to be, you know, to have all the answers or speak for your generation, but just to share your own thoughts and perceptions as, as brilliant young women who uh, know what's going on. So just to start off, um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, is sort of a broad overview of a question, sort of some of the, um, when you look now, and, and because you observe and see what's going on uh, around you, what, what would you say the biggest challenges and pressures that, that young people are facing today that you see and witness either from your own experience or what you're kind of seeing in, um, you know, in your lives today? Why don't, you know, just jump in and tell me what you're seeing. And I would say, um, I know that This is I, Gretchen, and this yeah, is Emma. Yeah, okay, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know I personally have always put a lot of pressure myself, yeah. you know, talking about that perfectionism thing again. Um, and I think that other things have kind of added to that over the years, um, especially with high school. I think that the expectation um, for these AP classes, mm -hmm. um, especially, is that, you know, it's all about the grades, and it's not mm -hmm. so much about the learning. And so, um, I think that that's been something that, because coming from middle school, you know, I was really trying to kind of work on my perfectionism and um, not focus so much on the grades. And then when you get to high school with, it's not all the classes, not all the AP classes, but some of the AP classes, you know, the teachers really focus on, you know, the grade that you get um, or the grade that you get on the AP exam at the end of the year. And so that has put a lot more pressure mm -hmm. on me. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what are you seeing, Emma? Um, just to build off of that as well with the exams, I think that something we personally experienced, because we were in the same class um, last year, was having a class that was so heavily focused on the exam that that was like the core of the curriculum. So that was the buildup throughout the entire year was that big exam. And then the exam not always correlating to your actual final grade, because that one day in that two hours set when you're taking that exam, that's not representative of who you are as a student or how much hard work you might have put in. Um, but a lot of kids and a lot of teachers and parents in general um, sometimes can really 
connect that grade and um, have it have a heavier weight than yeah. it actually has. Because so. one of the things you know that that I've been reading about and is this this idea is that there's been so much focus on sort of building a resume mm -hmm. instead of building a life. And high school is a time to explore and find out who you are, what your own strengths and passions are, and right. it's sort of being taken away, isn't it, a little mm -hmm. bit? Yeah. I would agree with that. I couldn't even see that um, on the Common App application when we're applying for colleges. There's just one section where you can put in all your extracurriculars and it's a limit up to 10, but then a lot of students feel the pressure that they have to fill those 10 spots in order to show colleges that they're active and passionate and um, really contributing to their community at school. But then the pressure to fill those 10 spots, they're then there's no time left in the day anymore because they're doing so many things at once. And how can so. you even enjoy the activities when you can? You can yeah. So many, I got to run from this one instead of in depth, just finding what you love yeah. and what you really love to do. Not mm -hmm. I've got to please people going into college, but I've got to find out what I love yeah. and what I'm good at and what I care about, you know, and building friendships. And of course, I'm answering all this for you because <laughs> I feel so strongly about what you what you've said what you've said. What, now, what about now, when you talk about sort of this is that whole academic pressure, what are the kinds of like, in addition, social pressures that, that young people are feeling today? And we know social media has had this incredible impact, mm -hmm. and we talked about it yeah. as part of the critical conversations. Can you speak a little bit about, because from one generation to the next, I don't think people fully understand the impact that that's um, having. Can you speak a little bit about that impact and, and maybe what we need to know more about that? Yeah, I would say um, like social media, I feel like especially since COVID happened and everything mm -hmm. and you know the only way to really connect with people was on social media. I feel like um, the use of it, you know, just kind of skyrocketed and I feel yeah, like yeah. coming back into, you know, normal or more normal in life <laughs> now, um, I think it's kind of a hard transition that people are, you know, you have to kind of step away from social media yeah. in order to make those in-person connections again because we haven't had those for, you know, two years. Um, and so I think that, you know, I know something we talked about a lot in yeah. our substance abuse task force meetings, um, you know, how people, if they're feeling lonely, you know, they could easily, you know, sit in their bed and, you know, just scroll social media all day, you know, and there wouldn't really be any, um, any consequences for that because, you know, maybe parents would be at work or, you know, they just didn't know what else to do. And so um, I think that that's something that a lot of people have had to deal with because most people didn't really know how to deal with COVID because it was right. something that, right. you know, we've never had before. Absolutely. Um, so I think that yeah. we kind of need to acknowledge the change um, kind of coming out of COVID um, so that kids can kind of separate themselves a little yeah. bit from social media because, yeah. and I think that there are a lot of good uses, you know, yeah. like it's mm -hmm. funny, like my mom has gotten into TikTok a lot, like finding recipes and oh, sure. all that oh, stuff absolutely. and she loves mm -hmm. it, but you know, you can totally just scroll for hours and hours and not realize, so. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think there are a lot of positives as well, but a big thing with social media that a lot of kids aren't aware of is that these apps aren't they're not for your benefit. They're not taking into account your mental health or your well-being. Right. They're just trying to get you to scroll as long as they possibly can to keep you on the app and mm -hmm. to create revenue. So when that kind of setup is involved and it's so easy to get addicted, a lot of kids will just scroll and scroll for hours and they're not really aware of what kind of influences they're um, taking into account or how they're being impacted with their well-being. and. I think that dependency on it that Gretchen was also speaking about during COVID created this like deficit um, socially, especially for a lot of kids like me who are introverted. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to transition from that, and then this um, reveal to like the outside world that we've been mm -hmm. having as COVID restrictions have been lessening, because you spent so long on your phone or um, getting comfortable within this little bubble that having to force yourself to get out of your comfort zone and um, speak to other people in yeah. a way that you haven't for so long right. is really uncomfortable. Are, are you so. seeing any of the, um, some of the stuff I've been hearing about and reading about is just a little bit of the, um, some of the cyberbullying that may be going on. Is that, does mm -hmm. that maybe more go away as you get to be seniors? That, that I know back in middle school when I was principal of middle school, there was a lot of drama that was going on, mm -hmm. um, a lot of it on social media and some of the bullying. Does that sort of, does that go away as, as kids get older and, or do you still see it as something that's? It's hard because I think that like, 
I remember like in school talking so much about like cyberbullying in middle mm -hmm. school. Um, and so I was never totally aware of like the different situations that were actually taking place. Yeah. I don't know if it's just because like I wasn't like in like the popular crowd and therefore like, and I wasn't on like social, yeah, social media all the time <laughs> too. Like, and I wasn't really one trying to like seek out like, oh, like what's happening yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I guess I kind of tried to stay out of it. So I, it's hard for me to compare yeah. um, because I don't really mm -hmm. remember any specific situations like you know, mm -hmm. before COVID and versus yeah. now. I mean, I don't hear a lot of things now off like the top of my head, but it could just be because I'm not like you know, involved. <laughs> In it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can agree um, with that aspect because likewise, I just wasn't involved in any of it. I wasn't being personally, um, personally affected yeah. by it. So I can't really speak on um, the amount of cyberbullying, but something positive that I have noticed after COVID um, is, the transition between who we were in like middle to high school, mm -hmm. at least the beginning of high school, yeah. to our senior year, I think that it's super common for middle schoolers and high schoolers to sort of um, put such an emphasis on superficial values like clicking up into these small little groups and bullying and trying to fit in and just comparing yourself to other people and that feeling like the be all end all. Um, but then afterwards throughout um, COVID and having to be confronted with these real world issues and yeah. something so scary. Something I've noticed, like we had our few, um, a few weeks ago, we had our senior banquet and I just saw those barriers, those social barriers break down so much and it was just so beautiful. We had this moment um, at the end of the dance when we were all like dancing in a circle. Oh, that's pretty and, cool. Like, yeah, oh, and singing, yeah. And, like, oh, yeah. singing songs together. Yeah. And it was just, it's yeah. an end so of, it's sweet. an end of, a, of an era too, but yeah. the fact that you bonded, that's a good mm -hmm. thing. I just know for me, if I had grown up with it, wasn't around when I was in, I would have been the one to be looking at what I was missing out on. I would yeah. have been the one to, because I was, I was extremely shy and introverted and never part of any of that. But if I had been seeing it all the time, it wouldn't have made me feel so good. But, yeah. you know, I, one of the things I was going to ask you guys about, which I just thought of, is when you talk about pressures and things you're dealing with, when you look at what's going on around um, outside of school when you look at um, Ukraine and you look at all the fighting that was going around masks and vaccinations and from a young person's perspective how, how does that impact you when you see all this going on around you um, it, is that something that you guys feel or is it something you try to just put back because you're dealing with so many other things mm -hmm. I was just curious how you guys were feeling dealing with all that I feel like it's like as more kind of you know, controversial things happen and all that. I feel like it's always in the back of my mind. Yeah. But I also feel like I'm trying to keep track of so many things yeah. that I never really got a chance to kind of reflect on it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the more I hear things, the more I'm kind of, you know, saddened by, yeah. you know, some of the things that are yeah, happening in the world that we live in. Yeah. Um, but I haven't really, you know, taken the time yeah. to kind of sit down. Well, because you've been busy. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, I think that being busy is definitely a distraction from all of those things. Like mm -hmm. I can relate to that as well, yeah. but thinking about it and um, just realizing like the wider scope of the world can definitely put things in perspective yeah. a lot. Yeah. Like um, we can put so much pressure on ourselves about a specific test or um, a game coming up or there's so like a million things as mm -hmm. a teenager that we brought in that it really isn't as important as we yeah. believe it to be. Um, but thinking about things like the war and even COVID, something that we've all experienced, I just, I feel like it really puts us um, in this place where we have to appreciate the things yeah. that we've taken for granted for so Absolutely. long, like having great conversations with people yeah. or um, hugging their loved ones, yeah. all those little things. Yeah. Um, I feel like shifting the focus to that can really I think help that's you really get through important, it. Don't you? I, I just, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of that um, f fear in, impacts our lives in so many different ways. But I, I know for mm -hmm. me growing up, it was the, um, we were terrified of um, the Soviet Union and nuclear war and the Cuban Missile Crisis was gone. And I, w I was only 12, but I remember palpably being frightened because mm -hmm. people were building bomb shelters and it was always in the back, you know, because you worry about you, you don't want anything to happen to your parents or mm -hmm. you just live in that fear. And then with COVID, it's, it's impacted so many families yeah. and just that fear of some loved one getting it, you know, and it's just, but it's another 
I just think that's another pressure on our young people too, that we have to have those conversations with them, you know, and just reassure them and create places in school of trust and safety, knowing that this is where you can go and, and have yeah. it. But one of the questions I was going to ask you, and I was going to ask you, I'm actually going to ask you, <laughs> so here we go, is um, so many young people feel that, that they're kind of alone with what they're dealing with, you know, if they're dealing with sort of an in, inner, inner turmoil, there's something wrong with them. and. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering how much emphasis or is there a place for conversation in schools around sort of helping young people to really learn about emotions and how to regulate them and how to, and how to develop coping strategies. And because when you think about the things you're going to need, the tools you're going to need out in the world, being able to understand emotions and deal with them and control them so they don't control you is critically important. I was wondering if, if these are conversations that happen at school or should we do more of those? I feel like we definitely should. I feel like yeah. we don't have a lot of that. I feel like school is really, um, I mean, I think that administration wants to try to make it better, wants um, yeah. to try to make it not all about academics, but I feel like it's really been a push for like, you know, you need to learn this and, you know, calculus and like just like different things um, that it's really all about academics mm -hmm. and I think that it would be really nice to have some of those conversations and I think that you know we had advisory like our freshman yeah. beginning of sophomore year before everything shut down um, and so I know like that was like an effort to kind of try to bring in some mm -hmm. of those conversations but then you know COVID happened and all that um, and I just think at least right now, like in our senior year, we didn't get a lot of that. Yeah. And so I think that's why I would kind of, um, you know, go seek out my guidance counselor yeah. to like try to have these conversations. Um, so I know I'm someone who like needs to talk things out when I'm feeling stressed. But you're also brave enough to go seek help and a lot of people aren't mm -hmm. at right. your age. They're just at any age, yeah. you know, that it takes courage to go seek help but a lot of because the stigma associated with it, you know, right. that it's, right. uh, wh what do you feel Emma in terms about mm -hmm. the need for those kind of conversations and do you think yeah. that we need to do more of that? And Absolutely. I think that, um, like Gretchen was speaking about advisory, something I personally been disappointed with about the school is the lack of those programs mm -hmm. and um, there has been efforts in the past like advisory and then I even remember in middle school one year we had like a mental health day mm -hmm. towards the end of the year where mm -hmm. we just it was kind of like a field day because yeah. we were just middle schoolers we yeah. were just playing yeah. games um, and there was even like a meditation practice and all those things yeah. I think that is so important mm -hmm. um, especially for middle schoolers and like early high schoolers because there's such a stigma around high schoolers about um, being difficult and having attitude and all those things, but it's hard to be our age as well. You know, I mm -hmm. think that a level of understanding is really needed um, and patience because we're having all of these pressures yeah. put on us either by ourselves or our peers or our teachers or whoever. And we don't really, we're not equipped to process them. Yeah. So that can be um, released through like deflecting it on our parents or our friends in these little bursts of anger or distance or however else somebody processes that. Um, so since we don't know how to handle all of those emotions, I think resources and teachings for um, meditations or whether it's a sport that somebody would like to play or mm -hmm. um, therapy sessions or um, painting, any form of expression yeah. that a student can be involved in to release all of that and really take the time to focus and be mindful would be really helpful. Don't you, th you know, when I'm listening to you, I, I was thinking that um, it, um, in, in, in the training that we give to teachers, mm -hmm. you know, that if, if all teachers, this is my ideal, if all teachers were trained in recognizing emotions understanding emotions and being able to talk through in every class you don't have to wait to go to a you know a counselor but if if your history teacher can say you know what I you know what I can tell today we're feel you know let's take a few minutes and do um, this or you know I know some of you are feeling really nervous about this you know this is how I deal with it and you know so one of the things I was going to ask you and I'm going to ask you is <laughs> and this is really important for, for me to know is how important do you view the relationship between the student and the teacher? How important is that in your happiness at school, in your success at school? 
this is something I feel really important that we get that out. Can you share a little bit about that, the importance of that connection and how it can be life-changing? I absolutely value, you know, really good teacher-student relationships. Yeah. Um, and that was definitely something when I was looking at colleges, like, I want to have a small class. Yeah. Like, I want mm -hmm. my professor to know who I am. I want to mm -hmm. have a good relationship with all of them. Um, and so, you know, like, English uh, freshman year with Mr. Dubana, like, we had a great relationship. Oh, I know him. Um, <laughs> I love him. Don't We're you love him? him. miss him so much. We're in, Is um, he gone? Yeah. Oh, he's not yeah. gone. You're gone. You just don't well, have him anymore. Well, yeah. so he um, he ran the 40% club. Of course. So we're yeah. co-presidents of the 40% yeah. club. <laughs> I interviewed the, that group when it first started. Oh, really? Oh, oh yes. so funny. Yes, I love him. I've interviewed him about three. Anyway, keep mm -hmm. going. So, um, so, yeah. so that's where we yeah, are right now, 40%. Great on us. So yeah. he was amazing. Um, so like I just I really really value um, those relationships like mm -hmm. um, Ms. Garino um, English sophomore year even just like over COVID you know we would like email and it was just like funny because you wouldn't really think that over COVID like you would you know get stronger in your relationships um, but it was great because she you know give these like journaling prompts and I would do yeah. it and she'd read them mm -hmm. and we would have these great conversations over email um, and it, that was just like a and great what did she teach, teach? what's English. English also yeah, yeah not, yeah. not, uh, right. not a counselor not a just right exactly yeah. and so <laughs> that was just like really really great um, mm -hmm. and like even like AP psychology this year like it's still an AP class but she takes every Monday Wednesday Friday that we have class she takes like 10 minutes in the beginning and we all meditate that's, together that's mm -hmm. great amazing yeah. Yes. Amazing, but it's like not every teacher's yeah, like that, yeah. and that's where it's hard to come yeah. from one class to that class, yeah. and it's just yeah. like it makes all the difference. I agree. I think a supportive teacher can make all the difference in the yeah. world, especially with students who um, are a little bit more quiet, or maybe yeah. they have something outside of school that they're dealing with, um, and. I think as well we have to have a little, a little bit of understanding for teachers who are a bit more strict because maybe it's just like the way they were brought up. Absolutely. Or, Absolutely. Um, and they're dealing with their own pressure exactly. and stress. Yeah. yeah. Um, even as far as like I was having a conversation um, about like race and um, LGBTQ conversations in class one day and well one some someone mentioned that one of their teachers said oh i'm just a math teacher how would i even i'm not going to like bring up certain heavy things because i don't know how to talk about it yeah and i completely understand mm -hmm. that um i think it's more about the personality but i do still think there's room for improvement and room to build um a supportive community within your classrooms where you can just open up the floor for conversation. You don't necessarily have to be the leader of it. You don't have to be an expert yeah. either, do you? Just, um, just let your students know that you're here for them mm -hmm. and um, you're willing to talk things out and just make them feel safe. Yeah, it, so. it's true. I just, I, I, think, I think one thing I realized as a, as a principal, um, it was one of the saddest days of my life when I was a principal because a parent came up to me and she said, my son feels um, invisible every day in school. He was, he was just one of those very, very quiet kids, and it was like this lightning bolt hit me. And I said, we can never let any kid feel invisible, you know, so in any, that, that every student needs to be seen, particularly those that hide behind masks mm -hmm. of indifference or whatever. They sit and they pretend that they don't care. They care, don't they? Right? right? Yeah. They do. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah. Um, but when you go, when you talked about like Mr. Jabano and um, when you go back, w can you just go a little bit more into the qualities of those teachers that you said Absolutely. that that made mm -hmm. them special to you along the way? The ones you found that somehow stayed in your heart, have stayed in your heart, and will forever when you look back at your time. There's something about. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Because I want to get that message out. Yeah, I would say um, with Mr. Jabano, he was he was so encouraging but at the same time you know we'd have class and you know he'd call you out you know for making a mistake and it was almost like I needed that I was yeah. going mm -hmm. into high school I was terrified of making a mistake and so you know when he would make light of like the different things in the class like oh that's not the answer like you know it was yeah. I, yeah. if he was a different kind of person and he was being mean about it like it would be different yeah. but he was you know making light of it kind of to um to kind of bring the class together yeah. and to just make you realize like if you make a mistake it's not the end of the world mm -hmm. um and so one thing so we had like poetry out loud which was like of course poems. i went to those i yeah. went to those yeah. so um i was i was way more shy freshman year than i am now like wasn't involved really in anything um like so scared 
Um, and so <laughs> I was like one of the finalists for the poetry I led for my class. And so the first place finisher didn't want to go to the next round. So he's like, well, who's going to represent the class? So like, okay, I guess I'll do it. Because, you know, he was like, he was like, you can totally do it. Like, it'll be fine, but whatever. But so supportive. And I was so he encouraging. Helped build confidence. He helped me stay after school. You know, we'd work on my poems together. Um, and then yeah. I made it past the next round and got, like, to, to the last round in, like, the school round. And it was just so encouraging that, you know, he kind of, he gave me the little push to do it. But I, it made me realize that, like, mm -hmm. I can do hard things. Yeah. And, you know, Who says just, that, Glennon Doyle? We can do hard things. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> I know, I know. It's in my head says. Of course, I say that to my daughter all the time. We can do hard things. We can things. do hard things. But when you have a teacher like that who just, get, just... It's, it's that trust again, too, in yeah. that respect. And mm -hmm. what about you, Emma? Yeah. Same kind of thing? Um, as well, with, I can speak on Mr. DeBona because yeah. we were in the same class. Yeah. Um, I just noticed that he had this great balance between keeping things light, but also, put, like Gretchen was saying, pushing you when yeah. you really needed it yeah. um, and shaping us. He, he just always had the best interest um, of us at yeah. his heart. Like, one thing is um, he would always play games and make jokes in class, um, always kept it light and comfortable. But then if we had a great discussion, like a Socratic seminar mm -hmm. situation, mm -hmm. um, or we were pre presenting something to the class, he would take off points if we used like or um, <laughs> or which I definitely, <laughs> I'm still struggling with. Um, but that's good I because just, being good speakers is really important. Absolutely, oh, right. and he made us conscious of those things, which is something I still um, yeah. is stuck with today. Yeah. And yeah, he was just always so supportive and really um, as... Yeah, that's true. You see, and now I'm going to start doing this. Yeah, too. you Thank definitely you. notice it yes. after. Yeah, of course. You, yeah. Yes. He was yes. just, he was so great. He was awesome. I was going to, um, I am going to ask too, if you were to, when you when you look back to your eighth grade self, mm -hmm. you know, as a former middle school principal and watching what, what particular young people go through at that level, yeah. if you were going to give advice to them or things that they should know or that help put in perspective high school, you know, what would you say to them? I would say um, to like if you know if things aren't exactly where you want them to be in your life right now like things will get better you have control over your life you know mm -hmm. um, and like basically if you want a change in your life you know you have the ability to go out and do that um, so you know just getting involved in things and you know if like your social situation you know with friends and everything like if it's not exactly what you want it to be like Things, things are going to change. Like, you go through different stages in your life, and, you know, you make different friends and new friends, and, you know, friendships go up and down. And Don't you think that's so, when you say that to me, it's mm -hmm. like just reassuring them, things are going to change. Yeah, mm -hmm. no you, matter what. You are going to change dramatically, yeah. and, and just yeah. understand that you're evolving, and you may not be as outgoing now as you're going to be later on. Right. Mm -hmm. That's who you are now. Yeah. What would you say, Emma? Anything else you want, you'd want to add to yeah, that? Yeah. Um, it's a bit cliche because I know it's so overstated, but really like to cliches. just yeah. absolutely just to really stop caring what other people think because yeah. as difficult yeah. as it is, yeah. it's just it's gonna make you so unhappy and so frustrated all the time if you're trying to measure up to these standards of other people mm -hmm. when they don't even know who they are yet. Like yeah. you're all going through that same pattern together. So those perspectives are so unreliable for you to measure yourself against. Yeah. And like you said earlier, like, we're still growing and evolving and we have so much room to grow. We have, like, we have time. I, I forget, like, we are still so young and yeah, the, you person, I know. Yeah, the person I'm gonna be in five years is probably so Absolutely. different from who I am Absolutely. right now. Right. So. Wouldn't it be a good idea? I, I'm thinking it's because it's mine. I think it's good for Yeah, I'm sure it's mine. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think when I listen to you, and again, I think about the, it's particularly the girls in eighth grade, wouldn't it be good to, to have like just a forum where um, high school seniors come down and talk to the eighth grade girls, you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I know there's that they do the high school experience and right. all that, and I'm sure mm -hmm. that helps, but just more of a... Um, informal kind of thing where you're just sitting around and talking and because they don't they don't people don't always want to listen to old people tell them about life they want to hear people who are going through it right now you know mm -hmm. wouldn't don't you think that you would absolutely. agree with me that that would yeah. be a very good thing absolutely. yeah i think yeah. that mm -hmm. would be actually yeah that would be very good I like that <laughs> okay 
Yeah. And this is like one of my final, like, see, now you got me. <laughs> like, oh, I stand. Uh, is I, I feel very passionately about this idea that, about the fragility of democracy and learning about history and our government because it's, it's young people who are going to go out and make the decisions and um, about laws and rules and, and how we live our lives and it's going to be in, in your hands, the environment and all of those big issues, civil rights. How, how much is that a part of conversation in school in terms of your role as to vote, the importance of voting, the importance of understanding both sides of an issue so you can become critical thinkers, so that you're not swallowed up by misinformation, that you can make these decisions on your own. Do we do enough of it? Should we do more of it? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Or is it something where you said, I don't really care about that? I think overall, we don't talk about the future enough, yeah. you know, in high school. I think a lot of it is about, you know, the here and the now. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you need to learn goals. this. Yeah, right. that's, and yeah, I that's think upsetting that, to me. Yeah. And it's, it's, it is, um, and I feel like, like it's funny because my anatomy teacher, he's very much about you know having a purpose to everything that yes. you're doing, everything that you're learning, um, and so um, there are a couple of us in my anatomy class are also in my chemistry class, and so you know we'll talk about how the things we're doing now, like we know that they'll help us like in the future because we all want to go into medicine, but like we don't really know any real world like applications, and so all the time he's like, oh you know talk to your teacher, you know ask her like what like what does this matter in the real world? Mm -hmm. um, because I think that we don't talk about that enough, especially in AP classes. Um, I feel like it's just a lot like, okay, you need to study this so you do well in this test. And As if that's, that's what it. life is all about. And right? then you move and on the, to the next yeah. unit. And, and then, then you're so like, lost when you get out of school. Yeah. yeah, because I feel like for so long that has been our mindset. Yeah. And once we break away from that, it's like, it's like okay. what do we do now? Because like, you have all this knowledge, but it's like, I, like, I can't imagine not going to school, no, honestly. I know. Um, yeah. I know it's like that day is going to come at some point, but we're just so in this routine. Yeah. And um, like you were speaking about governmental issues mm -hmm. and the importance of learning all of that and history, I think it's so important. And I think that those foundational classes, um, even though there is some mandate for them, I think that conversations like that need to be mandatory, especially for seniors yeah, and juniors, yeah. um, because we're in this mindset where we're forming these opinions and we're being influenced by all these other people and resources. But if we just take time to sit and learn and have these conversations, I feel like our eyes can be opened to so much and we yeah. can be more um, compassionate with one another Absolutely. and yeah. understanding of these other sides without being but polarized. That's, but you, you said it, you know, it's sort of compassion and, and empathy, you know. Mm -hmm. so when you hear the stories of different groups, um, the, the, the evolution of America, you know, all of the different people, but to hear their stories, then there's this, this you develop yeah. empathy, don't you, and compassion. And But I find that if we're not grounded in history, then you get swayed by any opinion that comes oh, along, yeah. right? If you don't have mm -hmm. that, because then you'll listen to, you know, the first nut Social job. Social media can tell you that. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's insane. So, I, I, um, your field, your passion is science and medicine, mm -hmm. art for yes. you, right? And that you're both, that's the, the path that you're, mm -hmm. that you're going to be taking. So, I just want to wish you both, um, not, you don't need Thank luck, you. but just, <laughs> I don't know, just whatever it is that, you know, just to keep going with this passion that you have and this kindness that you generate it. And mm -hmm. that's um, a reflection, I'm sure, on your parents and your family, and that's a good thing. So, mm -hmm. and I know you're busy, and I want to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and opinions and your you. um, passion for life with us today. And thank you for that. Thank and you. I want to thank everyone today for joining us on It Takes a Village, Raising Resilient Kids in Today's World. Thank you. This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. Thanks for watching.